Stephen, welcome to the show. It's a, it's a fantastic um, opportunity to be talking to you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So we're going to avoid the G word and we're going to only talk about the mean one. Um, so what I'm interested to know straight away is, was the actual skirting around of the G word and flirting with the IP a whole lot of fun for you or was it a pain in the ass to have to try and avoid it? Well, there are so many great G words out there. I'm not entirely sure which one you're talking about. Um, but, uh, <laughs> you know, when it comes to to making a parody um, and uh, kind of uh, towing the line, if you will, uh, with something that is maybe in the gray area of something we should or shouldn't be doing, mm. um, it was fun. It's fun. You know, I mean, we love these characters. You know, I think that when it comes to parody and fan film and public domain, like, you know, we want to take the toys and and bring them into our sandbox and kind of uh, you know do all kinds of fun things with them. So finding ways to kind of dance around the stuff that we shouldn't say, or you know finding ways to really put our stamp on it, um, was a blast. And sometimes you know because it's a parody and it's supposed to be funny, um, you know it gives you opportunity. Well, how do we take this problem and turn it into a joke? So mm. uh, it was uh, it was fun. It was fun. Challenging. I've got like an associate's degree in copyright law now, but it was fun. <laughs> Yeah, I bet. Mr. Finch, anyone? <laughs> that's right. That's right. I want to get a jersey made that says Mike Finch on that. <laughs> yeah, on that's the right. That's if you know, right. you, if you know, you know, you know. Um, it's been a great moment in um, horror film for adaptations of classic children's literature into horror films. You know, we've had the Winnie the Pooh movie, there's Arthur Four and the Banana Splits, and there's so many others as well. What inspired mm-hmm. you to tackle Dr. Seuss? Well, I mean... I've kind of always loved taking characters and concepts and ideas and and uh, things that we're familiar with and kind of turning them on their side, right? Putting my own spin on them. Um, and so, you know, something that's always kind of stood out to me, I was a used to be a teacher, you know, uh, right after I graduated college. And there's really nothing creepier than like kids drawings, you know, like uh, there's always a scene and even our movie has one where, you know, you've just got that, those like creepy crayon drawings that kids do. Um, and, you know, some of these like classic pieces of, uh, of literature and kids artwork, like if you look at them in the right light and from the side, you're like, man, that's that's pretty scary. And if and if someone was to describe to me the story of a tall, fuzzy, green, red eyed monster that hates everything, I mean, that, that sounds like a horror movie to me. Um, and so we just kind of picked up the lore and said, well, what is this most similar to, you know, it's, is he Bigfoot? Is he, is it like a slasher, you know, and uh, kind of just bringing in all those different references to the story while still paying homage to this thing that, uh, you know, that, that we know and we love. Yeah, absolutely. I want to sort of let's build upon that just a little bit, because as you mentioned, great children's literature, the great children's literature is steeped in horror. Like it just is, you know, mm-hmm. Roald Dahl's work, Brothers Grimm. And Dr. Seuss's stories certainly lend themselves very well to this kind of liberty, if you will. Um, where was your mind at, like, in tackling this? Were you hell-bent on pushing it as far as you possibly could when it comes to the horror? Like just despite Not- the fact that it's, you know, kid stuff? No. Honestly, no, not necessarily. You know, um, we, you know, these are characters we love and and kind of concepts that uh, have a, a special place in our heart for a reason. So it was important that we didn't just take an existing character and throw them into a different context. You know, it's not just Jason in space, right? We're mm-hmm. the idea was to to you know pay homage to love and respect to this you know original story. So we wanted to make sure it was still funny. We wanted to make sure it was still a Christmas movie. You know, we wanted to make sure there was a message um, and it's not just pick up this one toy and, you know, kind of mess with it, um, but instead kind of take the whole thing, the lore, the mythology, what makes it special and try to really something that I think even people have uh, who haven't seen the film are like, oh, they think we're we're going and, you know, just mm-hmm. ruining the legacy of this character. <laughs> and and it's an homage, you know, we uh the, the themes and the ideas of it um, are uh, are integral to the uh, to the story. So no, we didn't want to push the horror too far because, you know, um, we we still wanted to make a, a Christmas movie that was you know funny and scary, um, but maybe a little warm and fuzzy. It's funny that you mentioned you know people saying that you know you're ruining the legacy because you can't you can't ruin a legacy that's there like that's not going anywhere. And when we spoke to um, Reese Wakefield when he made the the uh, Winnie the Pooh Blood and Honey movie, we had all these comments on our social media about how deplorable the movie was and that it's ruined their childhoods, which you can't ruin someone's childhood now. 
obviously, okay. um, obviously, these people are just you know, fucking idiots. But like, I'm wondering if you face similar backlash, like you know, fiercely. Um, we have. I mean, it's. Uh, I mean, I do have a smartphone. I, I exist on the internet, so I'm aware <laughs> um, of uh, of commentary, good, bad, or otherwise, about yeah. our flick. Um, and uh, you know what really stands out to me is you know people make assumptions about uh, you know a movie or a project or really any piece of art um, without you know whether they're without watching it or engaging with it. I get it if you know I'm not a big fan of um, you know uh, historical documentaries, right? So mm-hmm. it's kind of hard for me to to critique something like that without viewing it. Um, and you know the only thing I ask is just that people uh, you know give our art independent, you know, silly, it's a comedy, right? Horror parody, a chance, um, because there, you know, I think it has some heart that uh, might surprise people, um, pun intended. Well, I mean, (laughs) also like the the only people that are really going to love a movie like this are people that already love movies like this. So it's not like you're Mm -hmm. corrupting, you're corrupting, you know, people or anything like that. Well, and on top of that, you know, we we take great pains to make sure, you know, whether it's in the marketing or in the the messaging that um, we don't want anyone to be confused into thinking this is something that it's not, you know, um, you know, we don't want a kid to accidentally stumble upon our film. Like, you know, we don't <laughs> want people to think that this is, you know, an officially authorized thing from the original creators. You know, they have their thing and, you know, we kind of have our playful twist uh, yeah. that makes up ours. Hey, you've also directed like a family drama in the past, so you can always direct people that way. That's right. That's right. <laughs> well, you know, I've done I've done other Christmas movies. I've done pro <laughs> wrestling movies. I directed Miss World America live <laughs> from Las Vegas in 2019. I mean, I've... Uh, I have a strange career and it and it just keeps getting weirder. <laughs> well, that's awesome. Eclectic, we'll call it. Um, how did locals react at the time of uh, the production being there on the streets and whatnot? Well, um, because the creature doesn't come out during the day, um, mm-hmm. out of context, for the most part, we just look like any other independent film. There's a police yep. officer, there's a you know, a young girl. Um, but once you start hanging like a Santa mannequin, uh, you know, and, and there's, um, <laughs> you know, our, our badass lead is like punching the Santa Claus suit. They're like, oh, my God, they you know, the neighbors are driving by. They're like, you they're killing Santa Claus. I said, yes, that's who it is. It's it's Santa Claus. <laughs> they, they don't mind about any any of the green fur or uh, or the teeth or the blood. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it was it was fun for sure. And, uh, you know, sometimes people would when they would see like the sketches or, you know, the movie has like a. Uh, wanted posters or missing posters or you know you'd have someone come in who's maybe just driving the rental uh ambulance you know or a police car or someone who's just dropping some things off or you know switch out a crew member for the day and they see the the creature suit hanging on the rack and they're like wait a minute is that (laughs) is that what i think it is you know so that's that's always kind of fun and we're like no i did any familiarity (laughs) any passing similarity it has to anything you may or may not recognize is uh you know, purely a fever dream on your part. Don't that's right. That's right. <laughs> you know. try. That's Mike Lynch. <laughs> Greatest gag in the movie. Um, and that guy that was in the Santa suit with the green fur and the eyes was uh, David Howard Thornton. He's become like a bona fide slasher icon now. Like he is um someone that fans sort of swarm to see at conventions and whatnot. How did you mm-hmm. luck out with him? Well, I mean, I've been following Terrifier since. Uh, you know, since Terrifier one, right? Yeah. Um, because a lot of people, not everybody knows this, but I went to high school with some of the producers, Fuzz on the Lens, who made Terrifier right. one and two. Um, so I've known them. You know, we went to high school together. We were shooting, you know, comedy sketches and you know, doing the news desk at you know at the high school TV station. Um, so we've been making movies and, and videos together and apart forever. Mm. Um, you know, and I had been keeping my eye on uh, you know on Terrifier and you know congratulating them, dude. I saw your movie on Netflix, and you know we're like, when are we gonna you know collaborate on something? And uh, we may have something in the works. <laughs> um, but as you know, as this project started coming to fruition, it became more and more clear we were looking for a you know mime clown you know uh, it was going to be a really performance based because we didn't mm. just want the creature to just be sasquatch lumbering yep. through the woods um and i said you know we should we should look at they're working with david right now on terrifier too we should look at terrifier um for uh, for david to potentially be our mean one mm. um we watched the film again i think amy my my wife who also plays mayor mcbean and produced the film we watched the, watched the film like this um, and we're like, you know, we saw him dancing around with the hacksaw. We're like, oh man, this, this, uh, <laughs> this could, this could be our guy. 
guy. And we reached out to him and it turned out he had played this character before, you know, in a various stage plays and he knew the, the source material and he had all of these ideas. And um, once he came out on set with the makeup and the hair and the hat and the teeth and the eyes and the whole thing, he did one take, no dialogue, right? No sounds. He did one take where he like rubbed his hands together and, and lurked across the screen and was like, how's that? And the whole crew there, you know, who had been shooting for weeks at this point, yeah. their jaws dropped and they're like, that's the mean one. I mean, it was was awesome. Really cool. Was there any crossover in production? So they already finished and wrapped up uh, Terrified 2 at the time or was he you know, hop skipping back and forth? Um, I believe they were, if they weren't done, they were 95% done. Most of the movie was in the can and, you know, yep. he was sharing some, you know, behind the scenes tidbits and stuff. And then it just kind of worked out that their release ended up as close to our release and they ended up going to theaters and we ended up going to theaters. And uh, it's just a great time to be an independent horror creator. We're not backed by a major studio. Our budget is, you know, very, uh, modest we'll yeah, say, yeah. Lo- wonder- a wonderfully creative obstacle uh, <laughs> and uh you know to see independent horror kind of pop up and, and connect with people and create these like theatrical experiences has been uh, has been a blast it's been really cool awesome awesome uh two more questions before i wrap this up uh first one being do you have any plans to adapt more classic children's books into gory slasher films because i think mary poppins is begging to be turned into a slasher <laughs> I love that. That's got to be the best part of, um, you know, going to conventions and, and meeting people is uh, I'm getting pitched like, <laughs> horror remakes of all kinds of crazy stuff. And I'm like, just so you know, <laughs> if you tell me and we haven't signed anything, it co- I could have thought of it on my own. OK, <laughs> yeah. so you're giving me this idea. Um, Not this one. I, it's I, on camera. It's on camera. <laughs> you've got it. You've got it. OK, fine. It's, I won't be stealing it. It's an homage. Yeah. Um, then it's flattery. Um, <laughs> you know, I I have one or two things that I'm tinkering with at the moment um, that I'm not at liberty to discuss is what I'll say. But um, you have not heard the last of uh, me and my team um, making horror uh, comedies. And uh, you'll just have to wait and see. Excellent. Well, we know it's not Bambi because that one's already in the works. Because <laughs> that one's taken. That's right. Yeah, that's Bambi's right. taken. Sleeping Beauty's taken. <laughs> Every time a new one pops great. up, it's like whack-a-mole. I'm like, okay, great. This is cool. I'm sure I know they're doing another uh, Winnie the Pooh and uh, yep. excited to see to see that one. And uh, I love yeah, that. Um, just... What was it? Luc Besson's official part four of the Arthur series is a horror film, like a slasher film. Like, that's w- really weird that the you know official part four would be a slasher, but um anyway, just just a side note. <laughs> look, it's a. I mean, if you look at even um, a haunting in Venice is uh, yeah. you know it's a third Agatha Christie, mm. and they're like, okay, well let's. I mean, it's they're selling it. The first two thirds of that trailer is just straight up horror, and then he comes out with his mustache, and you're like, oh, they made <laughs> another right. one of these. I know, interesting. <laughs> you know, I think we're gonna see. More and more flicks are going to lean really hard yeah. into, um, you know, if it's even mildly scary, they'll spin it like a thriller. And, you know, my only hope is that they don't, um, you know, I think like M. Night Shyamalan, a lot of his films, because mm-hmm. they cut those trailers to make them seem like they were horror films. And really, they were more thrillers, especially yep. his earlier stuff like The Village and things. Um, I just hope that they don't take the marketing too far because then people might be like, oh, I thought yeah. I was going to see something and now I'm seeing something else. There's and too much uh, deception we, going on, yeah. We want people to come see real horror movies, you know, and yep. uh, so even but, the um, uh, even the Bring It On franchise, their last installment was a slasher film. Go figure. <laughs> really? Yeah. 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 All cheerleaders die or something like that. Um, so final question. I ask this of a lot of people, like, what was the movie that got you into filmmaking? Like when you were young, what's the, the penny drop moment for you? The movie that got me into filmmaking. It's not the most... Uh, it's not the most original answer, but it would have to be Star Wars. Um, watching Star Wars on VHS, you know, the, uh, the not specialized, you know, these are like the, mm-hmm. the most lo-fi analog way to look at it. Yeah. Knowing that I didn't, I didn't understand what I was seeing. I didn't understand how they had done it. Um, I mean, that was the thing where I'm like, there's something organic here. There's puppets, there's, I, I think it's wires, but you know, I like my little brain couldn't wrap my head around what it was that I was seeing. Yep. Um, and you know, my first, my first movie was a little stop motion star Wars film. And I'm like hand drawing onto the film, the uh, like lightsabers and stuff. I mean, I, yep. I don't know. I feel like anyone who gets into genre, it's always, it's always star Wars or star Trek. Uh, mate, I speak to a lot of people and anyone of our generation, they owe a lot of um, debt to Lucas or Spielberg. One or the other. That's always the answer. 
And that's a good mm-hmm. answer. It's it was either that one or uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark. Yeah, um, that's right. It's always uh, I could teach a, a class on how much I, I could teach a class on a long boring <laughs> class on the first ten minutes of that movie because I just I just love that film so much. But that, <laughs> there's something about a the creation of I mean there's a lot you can do on a stage, you know, and there's a lot you can do with, with animation and, you know, cartoons and drawings and stuff. But when you really believe that boulder is coming at you or that giant spaceship is like actually there, this is in reality. I mean, there's, mm-hmm. it's uh it's, it's magic. It really is. And that's absolutely, um, that's why, that's why we do it, man. That's why we do absolutely. it. Absolutely. Those guys. Um, yes, they are. We, we owe them a debt of gratitude. The mean one is a hell of a lot of fun. It's a really, really cheeky horror film. Um, and I hope that as many people possible can uh, have the opportunity to watch it. Um, but thank you so much for taking the time to chat. It's, um, it's great to have you on the show. No worries. Thanks for having me. Remember that story about Cindy You Know Who? When her Christmas was stolen, she knew what to do. Why, Santa Claus? Why? But what if I said that's not how it went down? You gonna be okay? Because we can turn around right now. No. That poor girl. Her mother was killed in mind snap. Did you ever find the Christmas killer? I never got a reliable description of the man. Dad? Dad! He is out there! What if the Christmas killer is back? This town cannot go through another Christmas killer thing. Not again. Us folks down in Newville, we liked Christmas a lot. But that thing that lives just north of Newville does not. What is it? The mean one. He's slippery. He's elusive. He's a mean one, that mister. I'm not going to be a victim anymore. Time to roast this beast. You're a dead one, mister. Yeah!